Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Zoe, a member of the ICCT communications team. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and we will upload the recording to our YouTube channel soon. Everyone has their microphones on mute. If you have any questions, you can write them in the questions block to the right of your screen in the control panel. We don't have time to answer any questions live today, but we will collect your questions from this call and respond to you directly via email later. So please, please absolutely submit your questions in the questions box. We hope to get back to you. Just the presentation will take all of our time today. We are going to talk about analyzing Europe's CO2 standards proposal for trucks and buses today, presented by Eamon Mulholland. Eamon is a researcher on the Heavy Duty Vehicles Program. But before presenting Eamon, I would like to introduce Felipe Rodriguez, ICT's uh, Heavy Duty Vehicles Program Lead. Thank you, Zoe. Hello, everyone. Um, very glad to be here today talking about this uh, landmark proposal from the Commission uh, released just uh, a week ago. Uh, so before we start, I want to say a few words about the ICT for those of you who are not familiar with the organization. The ICT is an international nonprofit research organization working at the intersection uh, between policy and technology. Uh, we uh, cover all transport modes and uh, have presence in several uh, regions uh, with a historical focus on the main markets. Um, motor vehicle uh, pollutant emission and greenhouse gas emission standards is at the core of what ICT does. So we're very happy to bring today uh, the insights that we have into this proposal. Um, to begin with, uh, I want to say that what we're presenting today is a quite neutral uh, take of the, of the regulation. So we're aiming today just to present the facts. Uh, we're not uh, introducing um, any recommendations or any editorial comments on what was proposed, but we're just limiting it to the facts. What's in the proposal? Uh, how is it to be interpreted? Um, and uh, all the work that is going to follow in the coming weeks uh, from my city side will be to actually dive into the details of the different elements that we're going to present today uh, to be able to provide a more critical assessment of what's good and what's bad of what the Commission proposals include. But for today, is going to be quite down to what's in the regulatory text, which uh, can be uh, quite complex, hard to read, uh, but it's a fantastic exercise of um, capturing uh, a, a variety of policy design elements into an overarching regulation for all heavy duty vehicle segments, buses, trucks, and trailers. So uh, before we dive into the details, I, I wanted to start with this quote uh, by Vice President Timmermans. Um, I'm not going to read it uh, in its entirety. Likely you're familiar with it as it was in the press release of the, of the CO2 standards. But the element that I want to highlight is that, is that these um, CO2 standards are meant to drive zero emission technologies into the market. And although it might seem obvious uh, from the targets that were set, this is um, in a way something unique to this regulatory proposal around the world. Uh, we have different uh, approaches to uh, regulating uh, emissions from, from heavy duty vehicles in China, Japan, India, the United States. But this is the only proposal that we have that gets us close to zero, uh, forcing the adoption of these technologies and uh, making sure that we live in a zero emission world um, for the next decades. So, uh, having said that, I'm going to pass it over to Eamon, who is the ICT's expert on this regulation. Um, some housekeeping rules, as um, Zoe already mentioned, uh, likely we're not going to have time for Q&A, uh, but I will be looking at all the questions that you submit um, in the chat. Uh, so please ask everything that, that, that uh, you don't understand about the proposal, about the presentation, and we will make sure to get back to you. Um, and, and answer all of those questions. Um, so yeah, over to you, Edwin. Cheers, Felipe. Um, yeah, so to start off, to give a little bit of historical context for these standards, um, the first CO2 standards for trucks in Europe was introduced back in 2019, so not super long ago, 
But at the time, you could have argued that Europe was a laggard when it came to CO2 standards for heavy duty vehicles. It was already lagging behind some of the other major markets, most notably behind China and the US. And the standards themselves that were introduced at the time, they weren't overly ambitious. They were kind of middle of the road of what was already for in place for other major markets. So it was a 15% reduction for most new trucks by 2025 and a 30% reduction by 2030. But following the adoption, the implementation of those CO2 standards, it came an even more significant regulation, which was the, the European Green Deal, which turned into the climate law. Uh, under the climate law, it set the mandatory target that all sectors across Europe need to reach climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, so it became very clear very quickly that Europe's truck and bus sector was not on track to meet or to contribute its fair amounts towards this climate neutrality. Um, so then all of this changed as of last week when the European Commission introduced a new proposal and that set new targets for trucks and for buses. So it increased that 30% target up to 45% and then introduced a target of 65% for 2035 and a 90% target for 2040. Uh, so it stopped short of putting a full phase out of fossil fueled internal combustion engines but so undoubtedly it's one of the most significant CO2 standards for heavy duty vehicles globally. Um, yeah, so we spent the last week since this came out really combing through a lot of the finer details. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna go through today. What we found, what's changed, what stayed the same. So one of the biggest things that's changed is the scope of the standards. So under the original standards, only these four types of vehicles on the far left were covered. So those type of vehicles, they covered a lot of the annual emissions from heavy duty vehicles, close to about 70%. And now with the new proposal, it's introducing a lot more types of vehicles. So including different types of heavy trucks, some lighter trucks, um, most significantly coaches, buses, and trailers. Uh, trailers is a bit of a funny one because trailers, they usually aren't motorized, so they don't usually have emissions but they can contribute towards emission reductions of the motorized tractor that's carrying them. Um, so using things like aerodynamic efficiency improvements, you can use low rolling resistance tires using lightweight, lightweight materials. They can contribute towards emission reductions. So it's a, a big um, addition to the CO2 standards. Uh, sticking with trailers for a second, you've got two different types that are regulated. You've got your semi-trailers, which is the one on the top there, and you have box trailers, which are um, or drawbar trailers on the bottom. And so it's only box trailers that are covered under the regulation. So things like uh, tippers or flatbed trailers, they're not covered. But for the scope, when you combine all of these new types of vehicles, as well as the ones that were already regulated, it now covers about 96% of the CO2 emissions from heavy duty vehicles. So the vast, vast majority of emissions from heavy duty vehicles are now covered under this regulation. But it begs the question, what's not covered? And there's quite a few types of vehicles that aren't actually covered, but they each have either very low sales, very negligible emissions. So here are the main ones. You've got light trucks. Those are vehicles with a gross vehicle weight as low as 3.5 tons. Uh, four by four trucks aren't covered. Vocational vehicles, which are not for delivery vehicles. So that's like garbage trucks, um, concrete mixers, fire trucks. And then you have some unusual axle configuration trucks as well. But combining all these together, they account for just 4% of the annual emissions of heavy duty vehicles in Europe. So it's really a small share that's not covered by these standards. And then adding on to that, uh, there's also an exemption for manufacturers if they produce less than 100 vehicles. Uh, most manufacturers in Europe, there's a small number of them and they produce a lot of vehicles. So this anyone who produces less than 100 vehicles, it's a very, very small share. It's about 0.05% of all emissions from heavy duty vehicles. Um, the targets themselves, uh, they are differentiated by the different vehicle segments. So for trucks and for coaches, the target is 43% by 2030 relative to a baseline period at 64% for 2035 and 90% for 2040. And that baseline period, it's different for different vehicles. So the currently regulated trucks, their baseline was between 2019 and 2020. For the newly added vehicles that the scope has been extended to, it's going to be based off their emissions over the course of 2024 and 2025. 
So it hasn't been modeled yet or it hasn't been recorded yet, but their baseline will be based off what it happens in 2024. Uh, buses have by far the most stringent target. It's a 100% target by 2030. So it means it can only be, that target can only be met by zero emission vehicles. Uh, there is uh, an exemption which was put in the standards. It's a little bit ambiguous, uh, but it allows for member states to exclude certain buses from the regulation um, if they can prove that it's not able to be serviced by a zero emission vehicle. And to quote the actual regulation, it's owing to territorial morphology or meteorological circumstances. So it's a, a little bit ambiguous, but it does open the door for a small number of buses to be excluded from that 100% target. Uh, Semi-trailers, the target is 15% by 2030, and that stays constant. Drawbar trailers is 7.5%. Um, the compliance, so how a manufacturer's compliance with this, these emission targets is measured is a little bit complicated. So I'm going to try and break it down a small bit here. Um, it's calculated on a fleet-wide basis for every manufacturer. Uh, and so that, what that means is that a manufacturer has a little bit of flexibility that they can still produce a high-emitting uh, high vehicle if they compensate by producing a very energy-efficient vehicle of a different category. So every vehicle that is produced by a manufacturer, they, their emissions are um, calculated using a simulation tool. And so that simulation tool, it outputs what the emissions is going to be from the vehicle. And those emissions are then weighted based on the sales share of the manufacturer, as well as something called the mileage payload weighting factors, or MPW. So the MPW, it's a way for providing a greater weighting for vehicles that travel more and that carry more. So I've just picked out three examples of vehicles here. Um, the first one, it a tractor trailer which has a reference mileage of over 100,000 kilometers. It's got a payload of nearly 14 tons. That's granted a MPW factor of one. So then you've got different types of trucks. If it drives less or it carries less like the, the rigid body truck under it, then it contributes less. So the payload is about half the amount of the tractor trailer in the top. So that means the MPW is half. For a five ton truck, it's got an even smaller payload. So that MPW becomes just one twentieth of what a tractor trailer is. And so this MPW, it basically says that vehicles that drive more, that carry more, uh, they're going to emit more. So they need to contribute more towards the CO2 emissions of a manufacturer. So a tractor trailer, those emissions are weighted by one. For one of those smaller trucks, it'd be by 0 0.04. Um, so then when you get when you get those emissions, it's multiplied again by something called the, the Z-LEV factor. Uh, this is an incentive mechanism that is in place that it, essentially it can reduce a manufacturer's emissions by up to 3% if they produce enough zero emission vehicles. So it's just an incentive mechanism to try and encourage them to produce more zero emission vehicles. Uh, and then that produces your fleet average emissions for the manufacturer, and that's everything on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we've got how we calculate the actual targets. Now, it's calculated in exactly the same way, so it still uses a weighting of an MPW on the sales share of the manufacturer. But the only difference is, is rather than using the, the vehicles that a manufacturer produces, it uses a reference vehicle. And that, the emissions of that reference vehicle is based off those years I was talking about, 2019 for regulated vehicles, 2024 for upcoming to be regulated vehicles. And so that's, those reference emissions are calculated across all manufacturers. So then the, those uh, reference emissions, they're multiplied by the actual target, and then you have what the manufacturer's target is. So on the left-hand side, you have how much the manufacturer is emitting. On the right-hand side, you have their target. If a manufacturer's emissions are below the target, that's good news for them, they earn credits. If it falls above it, then that means they can earn debts. And if they don't have enough credits to offset their debts, then they may have to pay a penalty. Um, one of the biggest things that have changed, so this entire system is virtually the same as the in the original regulation, but the big thing that's changed is the compliance requirement. There's two compliance requirements, one for freight vehicles, that's trucks and trailers, and a second one for passenger vehicles and buses and coaches. So in practice, what this means is that if you are a manufacturer, you're producing a lot of buses, but you're finding it hard to meet that 2030 target of 100% zero emission buses. 
you can compensate by focusing more on coaches. If you improve the energy efficiency of your coaches beyond what's required by the targets, then you don't need to hit that 100%. You can go a little bit lower. What you're not able to do is, if you're struggling to meet that 100% target for buses, is focus more on trucks. So there are two different compliance requirements. So that's quite a, an important distinction in these new standards. Uh, there's a lot of different flexibilities in the, the regulation. Some have been modified, um, some have been added. So one that's been modified is the, the ZLEV incentive, which I already mentioned. So the, the ZLEV factor, it, it reduces a manufacturer's emissions by up to 3%. Um, there's two phases. The phase we're in at the moment is the super credits phase. It means that every zero emission vehicle that a manufacturer produces, it's double counted. And then if a manufacturer produces enough zero emission vehicles and their share is high enough, they can reduce their overall emissions by up to 3% using this ZLA factor. Under the benchmark phase, which comes into place in 2025, it becomes a little bit harder for manufacturers to contribute towards this um, ZLA factor. First, they need to meet a benchmark of 2% of sales before they can start contributing towards the ZLA incentive. Um, vehicles are only single counted and they can still only receive a ZLF factor of up to uh, reduce their emissions by 3% through the ZLF factor. Um, so the two big things that have changed is one is that it's going to be phased out. So after 2029, the ZLF factor is going to be scrapped. The main reason, according to the regulation, is because a lot of manufacturers have already pledged to go far, far beyond um, the amount that the ZLF factor was trying to incentivize. So you get a maximum benefit of up to 5% of a share for zero emission vehicles in the benchmark phase, but you have manufacturers who are going as high as 50% that they're promising to only sell half zero emission vehicles by 2030. So it became pretty clear that the ZLF incentive, it's not incentivizing much if manufacturers are already pledging to go far beyond it. So that's gonna be scrapped by 2030. The other big change, and it's a little bit ambiguous, but our understanding from the text is that buses will now be counted toward the ZLF factor. So previously it was only trucks and it was very explicitly only trucks that would count. The wording has changed, which seems to indicate that buses may be included towards this as well, which is a big game changer. There's not a lot of zero emission trucks, but there are a lot of zero emission buses on the roads. So this could be a bit of a game changer for some manufacturers who are already producing a lot of zero emission buses. They might benefit from uh, this settler factor as a result. And if I could just jump on, on, on that point, uh, Eamon, because it's an important one specifically for the super credits phase. Uh, the, the regulation is a bit contradictory. The proposal that we have is a bit contradictory because in, in the main text of the, of the regulation, it says that those non-regulated zero emission vehicles must be freight vehicles, right? But once you look at the formulas in the annexes, we don't see that anymore. So this is an open question so that um, we're not yet sure how to read the regulation, um, if by the legal text in the main regulation or by the, let's say, mathematical formulas in the annex. So that, that's an open question um, because it would be, as Eamon said, a massive change from uh, what we have up until today. Yeah, thanks for the clarification, Felipe. Um, so then the, another flexibility that's, that was included in the original regulation, but has changed slightly, is the, the credit and debt system. Um, simply put, if a manufacturer is going above what is required from the standards, they can earn credits. If they go above it, uh, if they're underachieving, then they may earn debts. Um, so I think the best way to explain it is imagine that you're a manufacturer and you've got baseline emissions around up here. So your 15% target is going to put you down at, at this point. So a line is drawn between those two and it's called a reduction trajectory line. So if your emissions are below that trajectory line, then you start to earn credits. But if 2025 rolls around and you haven't reached that 15% target yet, then you're going to start to rack up some debts. Now, the credits that you earn up until 2024, they can only be used for if you have debts in 2025. So it's just for that one year. But after that, you, have, you start earning credits in 2025, and those credits can be used to offset debts all the way up to 2040. 
So that is a bit of a game changer. It means that credits could have a maximum life of up to 15 years. Uh, to put it into context, the US greenhouse gas emission standards for heavy duty, their credit life is five years. So this is quite a bit um, uh, more generous towards uh, credits. Um, and then the same system applies that if you reach one of these targets, you haven't quite met it, you rack up debts, but then you can use credits to offset those debts. But once 2040 comes around, then you, there's no more credit or debt system. It's either you comply or you don't comply. So the main thing that has changed is that this initially ended in 2030, and now it's been extended for 2040, but credits can last all that time. Um, a new flexibility... Okay, just add one very short element on that one too, because I think it's important that we mention that manufacturers have to clear all debts uh, before a new implementation step of the standard comes into force. That is, if a manufacturer has debts in 2029, they have to clear them. That means they either generate enough credits in that year to clear those debts, or they have to pay the penalty associated with those emissions. And the same applies for 2034 and 2039. So this is an important element that manufacturers cannot just accumulate debts indefinitely, and they do have to pay the penalties uh, before each implementation year of the standards. Okay, so one additional flexibility that has been added um, is vehicle trading. Uh, so this didn't exist in the original regulation. So in the amended regulation, it now allows for manufacturers to essentially trade vehicles as a way of complying with their targets. And so the, the rules are slightly different for conventional vehicles and zero emission vehicles. So the example I've drawn up is for three different manufacturers. So manufacturer one and two, they're, they're connected. It could mean that they have the same parent manufacturer. They are allowed to trade conventional vehicles. So if manufacturer one, it's finding it hard to meet one of their targets, then manufacturer two could be overachieving. So then they can start to essentially allow manufacturer one register some of their vehicles in order to help them meet their targets. But again, that's only for if you're connected. So manufacturer three, who isn't connected, and they're not going to be able to trade conventional vehicles. Uh, it's a bit different with zero emission vehicles. Anyone can trade with anyone. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're connected or you're non-connected. It means that you can trade zero emission vehicles amongst everyone. It's limited to 5% of the sales volume of the receiver. So there's only a certain amount that you can actually trade. But it's good news for some smaller manufacturers who, you know, in this case, one of the manufacturers might only focus on fuel cell vehicles. Um, they will be able to allow another manufacturer to register those with the idea that they'll be compensated. So it provides a new revenue stream for small startups. But it's not exclusively for small companies. It means that larger companies who produce zero emission vehicles can also trade amongst each other. Uh, there's been a change in the definition of a zero emission vehicle. So under the original regulation, it was defined as having less than one gram of CO2 per vehicle kilometer. The reason that that was in there was because of hydrogen combustion engines. So you're probably familiar with hydrogen fuel cell. They use an electric motor, they run off hydrogen, but they don't have any CO2 emissions. Hydrogen combustion is a little bit different. It uses an internal combustion engine. It doesn't directly produce any CO2, but it does produce some NOx emissions. So if you've got NOx, it means you need to have some emission controls, like a, an SCR. Uh, SCRs, they reduce the amount of NOx, but they produce a very small amount of CO2. So this allowed for hydrogen combustion engines to have that little bit of hydrogen, uh, a little bit of CO2 from the emission control system. It's been increased by a significant amount. In the new proposal, it brings it up to five grams of CO2 per ton kilometer. So not vehicle kilometer, but ton kilometer. The difference is that an uh, average tractor trailer today, it emits about 55 grams of CO2 per ton kilometer. So this is about 10% of the emissions of a, a diesel tractor trailer today. And that would still be classed as zero emission. Um, this is significant for, again, for hydrogen combustion engines, but specifically for high pressure direct injection engines. Uh, these HPDI, they, it works more like a, a diesel engine. It works off compression ignition. Well, the other type I was talking about was more spark ignition, like a, a gasoline engine. 
with this HPDI, it needs to have an input of a small amount of diesel um, in order to be able to help the, the pilot fuel combust. And up to about 10% is what is needed. So this increase in the definition of zero emission vehicles, it's mostly making, it's opening the door for this new technology and new type of engine for hydrogen combustion engines, um, which rely on a small bit of diesel. So it's uh, one of the more significant changes that we noticed. Um, there's been a change in the definition of a long haul vehicle as well. So if you produce a tractor trailer, it can either be classified as a regional delivery truck or a long haul delivery truck. And that's based off some of its characteristics. So if it has a day cap, I, essentially if it doesn't have somewhere for the, the driver to be able to lie down, then it's classified as a regional delivery truck. If it has a sleeper cap and, that, and it has uh, a certain um, engine power requirements, then it would be classified as long haul. The big difference is with the MPW, which I mentioned earlier. So the MPW is how much the, uh, the vehicle's emissions are going to be weighted. So if it's long haul, it's given a weighting of one. If it's regional, then it's given nearly half of that. Uh, the new addition is this operational range. So now a vehicle has to have a minimum range of 350 kilometers, as well as a sleeper cab to qualify as long haul. It's pretty important for zero emission vehicles because it, it's a way of preventing uh, manufacturers from creating a, a low range zero emission vehicle, putting a sleeper cab on it and trying to benefit from a, a higher MPW. So now it means that they need to reach this minimum range requirement before they can be classified as long haul. Uh, there's been a change in the penalties. So originally from 2025 to 2030, the penalty was 4,250 euros per gram of CO2 per ton kilometer uh, multiplied by the number of vehicles. So to put that into real terms, it means a manufacturer who sold 25,000 vehicles, if they missed their target by 1%, that equates to a fine of about 57 million. After 2030, that, would have, that fine was planned to increase to 6,800. That would have meant a, a fine of 92 million for missing a target by 1%. The 2030 value has been scrapped. So now it's only 4,250 from 2025 onwards. So it doesn't matter if you miss your target by 1% in 2025 or 2030, you're gonna be paying the same amount. So that's, those are the, the bulk of everything that we um, wanted to cover. So just to, to kind of put it into to one summary slide, the main aspects to take away are that trucks and coaches, they have an ambitious target of 90% uh, reduction by 2040. Uh, buses have the target of 100% reduction by 2030, um, but compliance is allows for a little bit of flexibility. So. Uh, a bus doesn't necessarily need to get to 100%. They can rely a little bit more on, a manufacturer can rely more on coaches to help them meet that target. The z lev factor, it's gonna be phased out from 2030. So that incentive mechanism is gonna be gone from 2030 onwards. Uh, there's a new rule allowing manufacturers to trade vehicles with some exceptions that I mentioned. Uh, the credit life has been increased. So it used to be a maximum of five years and it's been increased to up to 15 years. This emission threshold, for zero emission vehicles, it opens the door for new types of technology for hydrogen combustion engine, and the penalties for 2030 has been lowered. And the very last thing I wanna end on is we did some initial modeling of what these standards actually do in terms of uh, Europe's heavy duty emissions. The big picture is that we projected it decreases emissions by about 77% by 2050 relative to 2020. It's huge reductions in buses and coaches, significant reductions in, in trucks. But to put it into context, Europe also has the goal of a 90% reduction target for all of transport by 2050. So it falls a little bit short of what the commission is planning to do. And especially when you consider areas like maritime and aviation, which are gonna be a bit more difficult to decarbonize than trucks. And this 77% is falling a little bit short of what's the, the target for the commission. Um, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pass it over to Felipe to finish it out. Thank you, Eamon. So uh, we're only two minutes uh, past our allocated time. So thank you so much for being efficient. I know that this regulation contains a lot of elements. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to continue putting out analysis of the regulations. So stay tuned uh, with the ICT website.
We have a wealth of material that we have already produced in preparation for the proposal, so be sure you check that out as well. Uh, we're going to leave the call open for a few more minutes so that you can uh, finish typing those questions, and we're going to get back to you um, via email um, once we have clustered those questions and identified the uh, key topics being asked. So, um, yeah, thank you for joining. Um, we'll leave the call open for, I don't know, five more minutes, three more minutes so that you can uh, finish those questions and uh, have a good rest of your day, and we will see you soon.